Uh, I'm going to try and uh, do this without the uh, the microphone. Uh, everyone can hear me, okay? Great. great. Um, look, it's really really good to be here. I came to my first Brains um, conference back in 2019, um, I uh, and was kind of really blown away by um, not not necessarily the conference, but the people that were in attendance. Uh, there, an incredibly um, humble, genuine, authentic, passionate group of people, which um, I get the opportunity to talk a lot at brewing and. Uh, and distilling conferences and, and brewers distill a great bunch of people um, but there's something about well, something about the people that are in attendance of, of, of grains and I'm assuming it, it's, it's bakers um, of this kind of I don't know, in, in brewing particularly the way craft brewing is going it's becoming very trend and hype driven and this kind of quest for world domination and getting beers all around the place and the, the vibe that I got from, from grains was that bakers just wanting to do the best they could uh, for their own community, using the best quality ingredients. That was kind of the vibe I got. So I was really honoured to, to be asked to come and speak here um, from Michael. And um, yeah, he said I've got an hour uh, and could talk about whatever I wanted to, which is probably a very dangerous thing to do um, because I'm pretty passionate about grains. I've been growing grains for, for a long time and it's basically been my life through beer, whiskey, um, farming. Uh, and I am very passionate about it and can talk for hours about it as well. I guess the one takeaway from this I haven't had much sleep. Uh, we've been fairly, like a lot of businesses out home, we're very understaffed as well uh, at the moment. Um, so I didn't really get to put the effort into this presentation as I would have liked. So I've taken bits and pieces from previous presentations, thrown it all together, um, and haven't had a chance to kind of really go through it. Um, so it's going to be kind of fairly fast paced. It's going to be all around the place. Uh, if you take one thing away from this presentation, I hope it's that um, you know you sense my passion, and I'm more than willing to talk for hours on the phone or via email about any of the grains we grow, how we malt. We do a lot of um, our work with other malt houses. We've got no secrets, um, whether it's around um, whiskey or beer or regenerative farming practices. Um, yeah, if that's the one takeaway, I'm more than happy to, um, to talk about it later on. Um, so what I did try and do was kind of divide this presentation up into four main areas. Um, this is fairly awkward for me, but I, having to follow the presentation up here, but it is good because I spent uh, nine hours on the bus and train trying to go to sleep on this, so it's stretching uh, <laughs> stretch <laughs> muscles. So it's actually not too bad. Um, but we're going to split into four main areas. One, we're going to talk about the Voyager story, how we, we got started. Two, we're going to talk a little bit about the malting process. I'm not going to go uh, too deep into that because Tova's going to talk a little bit about that in the next presentation as well. Uh, then we're going to talk about the function of malt in bread. Uh, and then I'm going to share with you a few slides that I've been running from brewers and distillers around this malt or grain renaissance, this period of time that we're, we're entering into, which I think is really or trying to get brewers and distillers excited about this, this, um, you know, this new variety, or old heirloom varieties and, and regenerative farming practices. Uh, and through that, hopefully um, you guys get to see how, how one, brewers, distillers and bakers are all, there's so many similarities between what, what we all do, um, but also about how we can uh, you know, work with more heritage varieties and, and, and regenerative farming practices. Um, it was actually, this is the first time I've actually gone back through some older presentations and pulled some slides out. And this is one from a presentation back in 2017. This is our, myself and Brad, um, a business partner there. I went to school with Brad at Burrellen, um, our hometown, and went to university. Um, we've been best mates ever since, and then we started, started Voyager Malt. Uh, and on the right there is our, um, our original processing facility, which we still run to this, this day, um, that we, we set up two and a half years ago. That was uh, 2016, was that eight, eight years ago? Is that right? Seven years ago. Um, recently, we just expanded to a greenfield site um, in Whitton. Um, we had the opportunity to basically design our ultimate craft malt house. Um, when we started, we just made a lot of mistakes, we built a lot of equipment, we continued to make mistakes and, and work things out over a period of time. Uh, and then we got to a stage where we needed to expand and we were able to move up, uh, up the road to a, to a new paddock and design um, and put together this malting facility, which looks fairly big. Um, in the scheme of things, in the scheme of malting, it's still by far one of the smallest malt houses, um, particularly in Australia, that's for sure. Um, in fact, the, the amount of malt that we produce in this facility is somewhere around the 6,000 tonne, um, which the, the, you know, the big monsters would, would waste or spill more than that in a, in a year. So in terms of what it looks probably fairly, fairly elaborate, it is a very small malt house in the scheme of things. Um, 
But what we did do is we teamed up with a, uh, um, another uh, business that put a, a, essentially a tourism facility uh, attached to it. So the Witten Malt House there is accommodation on site and we had a whiskey bar and a craft beer bar inside and windows that you can look through and see the, the malting process. And the whole purpose of that facility was really to highlight um, to, to consumers that like wine, beer and spirits are, are agricultural products. Um, and the fact you can sit there and look out the windows at some of these heritage grains that we're growing and taste beers and spirits that have been made with them uh, and then look at the malting process and kind of tie that all together so that um, yeah, people understand that, that these products start in the ground. Um, this is a photo taken uh, back in my hometown, Berlin, back in 1932. Um, and this was an Australian record for the most amount of, of grain bags received uh, to, a, to a silo on a given day. So it's 13,000 um, uh, bags of wheat. Uh, and I'm led to believe that those bags of wheat, you can see on the back, weigh about 80 kilos. Um, and you see the old, the old videos of, of guys lugging them around and throwing them up there. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure how they do that. We struggle with 25 kilo bags. Um, but uh, the reason for that photo is, is just to highlight that Borellan has a rich history and is a, you know, right in the heart of cereal grain production. Um, this, this year, the, the grain silos, um, you know, Grain Corp are putting in a 250,000 tonne expansion onto the, um, uh, the storage facility there. Uh, so it is the main industry uh, out there. Um, and now Borellan's kind of famous for, uh, for the big tennis racket, <laughs> um, which is, is situated right in the middle of where all those, uh, those horse and carts are. Actually, every year, they, two things Borellan's famous for, the big tennis racket. So Yvonne Goulgon was born in Borellan, and a group of farmers um, decided they'd build a replica tennis racket and um, mount it up in the, in the main street. Um, but it also holds the record for the number of um, Clydesdale horses hooked up in tandem pulling um, a, a, a wagon every year, uh, and they try and beat it every year. I think they're up to 32 or 33. And that's held at the Borellum Good Old Days Festival, uh, where they recreate a lot of older um, farming um, practices, and uh, it's a big draw card for the, for the town. A town of 300, um, I think they've got 10,000 people over the weekend there, so it's a huge um, yeah, event for, for our small little town. Um, as you can hear, I'm pretty passionate about our town. I was born and raised there. Um, went to school at Borellan Central School, which is a kindergarten to year 12 school. Uh, I was the only student in year 11, 12, uh, school captain for three years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it wasn't, wasn't because I repeated, as a uh, few people I mentioned. But, um, and probably one of the reasons I stayed on, most of the other students went away to, to, to boarding school, was that for my 12th birthday, I was given 50 acres of our parents, fourth generation um, cereal grain uh, farm. Um, which sounds like a like a you know impressive present, and it certainly was. But it was rather given to me as a way of rather than mum pay me, mum and dad pay me a wage for working on the farm on holidays and weekends. Um, when and they weren't able to do that when times were tough or during the drought, um, this is a way that they could you know I could earn a bit of pocket money I guess for working on the farm, but also learn about farming. They didn't teach me anything at all. They didn't teach me about. Um, but basically said, here's 50 acres, you still work for us and you can borrow any of our equipment to do whatever you like in that, in that paddy. Very first year I grew a, uh, a bumper wheat crop, um, fluked it, it was a great season as well, and grossed $12,000, which for a 12 year old kid was a lot of money to have. Um, uh, again, mum and dad didn't teach me anything about saving or, or whatever, and I've got no idea what I even spent that money on. Uh, I do know it at the, uh, the Borellan show, that year agricultural show, I was the man giving Dodge and Car rides out left, right and centre, um, which is possibly why I maybe got voted in school captain three years in a row. Um, but after that year uh, was then the millennium drought, so we had 10, ten years of, um, you know, of drought essentially. We pulled the header out of the shed three years where we had able to harvest the sea. So what it did teach me was that farming was fairly tough and unfortunately wasn't going to um, be the right choice for me to go back there because it wasn't going to support mum and dad and myself. So I went uh, to university up the road uh, and like a lot of other, um, you know, my, my mates in the area all got pushed off the farm as well um, during, that, during that time. Uh, but went to university, I studied engineering. In my first year met a girl that became my wife. She was studying winemaking uh, and her parents owned a winery uh, just up the road in Griffith. Uh, and in an attempt to try and impress her, thought I needed to learn about wine. Um, 
I tell the story that I was drinking copious amounts of wine at the time, but it was in uh, Goon Sunrises, which was red cordial, orange juice, and cast, cast wine in there. Um, so I set out on this mission buying bottles of red and researching and looking at different wine regions and exploring palette weight and, uh, you know, and tannin and all this kind of stuff. And started, I naturally just started applying that to other things I was drinking and really found my passion in beer. Um, for a small little uh, country kid, I never had any um, aspirations to travel whatsoever. Um, I was brought up on the land, um, lived in Brelon and other than going to, to Griffith to get out shops or get out, get, go to the shops to get out our groceries, I didn't really have any aspirations of travel whatsoever until I got into beer. Um, and within the space of probably 12 months I was visiting monasteries and brewing with monks in Belgium and um, all throughout Bavaria and, and just become obsessed with it. Um, I went to this brewery in, um, on, on this, this farm in, in southern Germany uh, and had uh, this Hefeweizen, a, a German style wheat beer um, that just was phenomenal and uh, I was talking to the, the brewer about it and he, the brewmaster came out and said look it's, it's a very simple beer he said we, we grow the, the wheat in that paddock out through the window there um, the hops come from the hop line over there we brew it here and here it is it's served fresh it was brewed last week and it's a, a beer style that is, is you know, best enjoyed fresh and it was kind of strange but I had this this light bulb and it was kind of weird because I'd been growing malt grape barley our, our family been doing it for generations and I'd love beer, but I never really made that connection myself. Here I was in the beer industry, um, or wanting to get into the beer industry, obsessed with beer traveling the world, and growing grain that was potentially going into beers all around the world, but I didn't make that connection whatsoever. Um, so on the plane back, uh, I didn't sleep at all. I basically put this business plan together to start a brewery up in our hometown, um, and it was gonna use grain from our own farm, and like what my wife was doing at her parents' winery, we were gonna champion the grapes and the paddock it come from, and and the provenance and the terroir and tell the story of a drought when protein levels are higher, the, the um, alcohol is going to be a bit lower, the beer is going to be a bit hazier and it's going to have you know, a slightly different flavour profile and, and whatever. Um, Brad, my business partner, he went to university as well. Lucky for me, he did finance uh, and accounting over there. Um, but when I got back, I showed the, you know, my ideas to him and he ran the numbers and said, look, this, this is kind of really before craft beer was a thing. Um, and we were looking at the, the cost of brewing equipment and bringing it in from overseas and he just said, look, it's just not gonna, gonna work. Um, so we crowdfunded the idea, or crowdsourced it, uh, and we tried, we thought if we could raise $15,000, we'll set up a non-for-profit entity in our town. If we can raise $15,000, that'll be enough to, to get um, some barley malted, get some banners, some posters, some kegs, some marketing done, um, and we'll get the beer brewed under license at another, another brewery. Uh, we raised forty-five thousand dollars in thirty days. The community got right behind it and had people pledging, um, you know, their daughters' um, graphic design skills to come up with labels. And we had the community come along to recipe tasting nights, uh, and everything was going unbelievably well. We had a, a great parcel of barley that we we're going to use use for it. Um, we started doing the numbers and realised that um, a ton of barley makes a hundred kegs of beer. Um, so a population of 300, we didn't really need too many tonnes of barley to get this project, or, or you know, to get first batch malted and to get the first beer done. Um, so we uh, it got very late in the in the piece. We had banners up on the outskirts of town advertising our beer. We had a launch night, um, and we had kind of a month to to have this beer brew. And I just assumed you could take a bulk, a bag of malt barley to to the big monsters, uh, and they they malt it for you. We, again, we've been selling malt grape barley to, to the big malting companies for, for generations. Um, and uh, we kind of got laughed, laughed out of there when we went and saw them. We spoke on the phone and they basically said, look, for us to, to run a, a small little batch, we'd need, need probably about 10,000 tonne um, to look at kind of working it through um, and, and keeping that whole traceability. Um, again, I'm not good at maths, um, but 10,000 tonne is a hell of a lot of kegs. Um, so basically, we ha I had to put my engineering skills to use and build a little malting vessel to make this um, first batch of malt to get this project off, off the ground. Um, just to kind of step sideways, Australia grows 10 million tonnes of, of barley. Uh, the majority of that is all exported um, as either feed barley or to be malted overseas. We do keep a million tonnes uh, here to be malted, uh, but of that, about 90% of that is also exported. Um, so it makes sense that these malt houses are in the are in the ports, so they can be malted and loaded on ships. 
to the whole brain research. And I guess probably what I'm getting at here is, is you know, it's probably no different. You know, a lot of this goes into making uh, mainstream commercial lager that you can get all around the world. It's probably no different to the to wheat and the, the sliced white death um, bread that, that's out there in terms of. So there's a lot of similarities between beer, beer and, and bread. Um, but so that the trains come through the you know throughout through Brillen and everyone's grain from all the farms get taken there and get homogenized and blended in and then the train goes through these different regions on the way down to the port uh, and it gets further blended in and, and it, it's a system that works really well for what they're trying to do this homogenized kind of whether it's you know there might be a, a particular area that, that's had a, a tough dry finish so the protein's a bit higher there um, moving further down south and might get some lower protein barley and blended in so that it becomes this very you know consistent homogenized product which is the exact opposite of what we were trying to do for Barilla and beer. Uh, and it was kind of at that point once we got the Brellon beer off the ground and, and just saw that there was a bit of a need for, for this, we had, once we launched the beer, we had um, several brewers call us up and basically try and call us out saying, we know that that grain didn't come from you know, you, you, you know, your parents' farm or from that town because there's no way of getting it malted. Um, and we'd basically done it ourselves and that's how we kind of, um, that was back in 2014, I think, and we've never stopped um, malting Malting ever since. Um, so we supply now more than 400, I think it's close to 500 breweries, distilleries, and bakeries um, around Australia. And we've started exporting recently to a couple of distilleries in Japan. Um, we make very small batches of malt, um, which gives us uh, you know, a lot of flexibility to run a, a wide range of, uh, of products. Uh, and all our malts are segregated, so everything goes out with a QR code that links back to the back to the farmer. Um, we like to say that our malts are crafted in the paddock. Um, you can't make great malt without great grain. And what we found from early on, there's a lot of research now that I'll talk about later on that's starting to back this up, is that um, uh, variety and farming practice um, does matter in terms of flavour in beer and more so in spirits. Um, we like to um, really celebrate and champion uh, the, the grower. Um, so on a certificate of analysis that goes out, it's got all the specs of the barley, but it's also got specs about the farmer, um, that paddock, how that paddock was treated, um, and some comments from the farmer as well, and the farmer's details. Um, we really like creating that connection between the brewer that's still a baker or, you know, and, and the farmer and having them come out and visit them. I've got this analogy, uh, I'm not a baker at all, um, and so it relates more to beer, but I'm assuming that, that bakers in the room will be able to kind of adapt it to, to uh, fit them. But for this analogy, it, and it goes something like this, it takes seven minutes to, to drink a beer. Uh, it takes seven hours to brew a beer, is, is brew day. Um, seven days is the malting process. By the time we steep the grain, kill it, um, and it package it up. Uh, seven weeks is the extended fermentation, lagering, bright tank packaging of the beer. Seven months is the growing process. We normally grow in March, um, Plant in uh, sorry in uh, May, harvest around November December, um, but seven years is the crop rotation uh, cycle of the, of the farmers that we work for. So I like to re remind, particularly distillers who talk about whiskey being a long game because once it goes into a barrel, it has to sit there for two years. I like to remind them that um, seven years before they got that grain turned up at there, or before even we got the grain, um, there was a farmer making decisions about that paddock or that um, grain that was going into that crop. Um, I think it really has a bit of a mind shift of who the real heroes are and what we all do and the, the risks and the sacrifices that, that a lot of the farmers are out there making and doing it uh, um, alongside the challenges of, of climate change. It's, you know, it's something that I do get fairly emotional about. Um, you, know, you look at things like suicide rates among farmers and, and in regional areas and um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, something that, uh, yeah, well, so we're really passionate about trying to highlight and, and elevate the role um, that farmers play. So before we do a lot of uh, work in different farming systems and, and older varieties, we're playing around with some native grains as well. Um, um, we've got one of the biggest ranges of organic, certified organic grains in the, uh, in the world. A uh, big focus on sustainability. Um, we did an audit recently uh, around measuring our own carbon footprint. Um, and we do, we've got, there's a lot of sustainable measures that we do, and I'll talk about those a bit later on as well. But by far the biggest impact uh, is in the paddock around the use of nitrogenous fertilizers. Um, and there's some pretty cool stats that I'll, um, I'll show you guys in a minute as well. Um, 
and we produce malts for our, um, artisan producers. Basically, we, we, all the grains we grow, we look primarily at from a flavour point of view. Um, once it, 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 it's giving us something unique or something different or something interesting, then we start working through the agronomics of it with the grower and, and everything else. So our malts aren't necessarily the easiest to process, they don't yield as well, um, but they've got some really unique flavour um, profiles. Um, cool, so we're going to get into a little bit about the, the malting process. I'm only going to touch on this really quickly because um, Topher's going to talk a little bit more about it. But basically you can't grow malt. Um, you might hear a lot of farmers talk about malt barley. Uh, basically it's, it's a grade that, they, that they're talking about in terms of whether that barley can go into be malted. So essentially malting is a process that we perform on a wide range of, of grains. Um, we do pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, millet, corn, rice, um, you name it. Um, we've, we've had great wattle seeds, um, oats. Uh, and basically the process is pretty simple. It involves wetting the grain, germinating it, and then stopping it from, from germinating once um, the starches inside have been modified. Um, one of the reasons why I think particularly a lot of farmers don't know much about the malting process, and probably even, even brewers, um, is that barley and malt essentially look exactly the same. The raw grain that comes in and the malt that leaves us, see here, or plus some of these around later on, but it looks exactly like, like raw grain. Um, however, in the, inside that grain, there's a lot of chemical um, reactions that have happened. Uh, and in the middle of that process, rootlets have formed on the, on the grain and acrospire has grown underneath it as well. So despite the grain looking the same, um, it's quite different. Um, so white malt, essentially um, malt has been used because you can't get sugar from, from a, a raw grain. Um, it needs to be malted, it converts as basically long chain starches into shorter chain starches and it also develops enzymes which then can kind of convert that into sugar. So essentially malt has been used because it's a sugar source. And once we've got sugar, we've got yeast, we've then got alcohol, and then we can, we can get beer, or, or, and then distill that to get, get spirit. Um, but what's often overlooked uh, in terms of, of what else malt brings is color. And this is for, these points here relate to, to beer, but they also relate, to, um, relate to, to bread and baking as well. So malt we can use for color. Um, malt has a, a really broad flavor profile. We've got a lot of malts up here that are smoky, we can have acidulated malts that are quite sour, um, toffee, nutty, we can roast them to coffee spec, we can um, change the malt to get malt that tastes like popcorn. Uh, it really is a, a broad um, palette to, to um, yeah, develop a lot of different flavours. Um, malt adds a lot of mouthfeel um, and sweetness to, to, to beer, um, but also it's used as a, as a, um, a flavour or an additive to a lot of uh, confectionery, chocolate bars, breakfast cereals, um, breads as well, because it does provide this this you know, um, soft, big, round kind of um, flavour. Uh, it's really important in beer for foam and head retention, uh, and there's also a hell of a lot of minerals and vitamins that are maintained uh, as well through the malting process. Uh, so here's some germinating grain. Uh, this is on day, it's like probably day two of germination. You see the rootlets there. Um, on some, some barley. And the malting process basically goes through these stages here, grain selection, grading, steeping, germinating, kilning, decombing, cleaning, roasting and packaging. Uh, as I said before, the first one for us is really important, grain selection. You can't make great malt without, without great, great grain. Um, and a lot of the varieties we've started with um, were basically back when I was 12 years old and looking for something that was different or unique to grow, um, propagating up um, varieties that we got either from the Siege Gene Bank or, or from old clearing sales or, or whatever else. Um, and we found that the further we go back, the, the far more interesting characters and flavours that, that um, have been in the grain, um, basically because they haven't been bred out of it in, in uh, in place of yield and drought tolerance and disease resistance and all those kind of things. Um, the, next we move into the steeping process, which is really water intensive. Um, to make one tonne of malt uses about 8,000 litres of water. 
Um, that's just in the malting process, that's not the growing process. So it is very water intensive. Um, basically we're, we're steeping that grain and we're trying to bring the moisture content in that grain up to a level where it wants to start growing. Um, which is about 45%. So malting on farm, we have the benefit of actually able to utilize water that was destined for irrigation, use it in the malt house and then push it back out to, to irrigate our crops. Um, it's really important in the steeping process that the grain size is, is consistent. It uh, doesn't matter whether the grains are small or large, it just matters that they're all of a consistent size. So one of the important processes for us when we get grain that comes into the a malting facility um, is that we size it up and, and take the bulk of it that is a certain size. If you've got a small grain and a big grain, small grain takes water up quicker, it wants to start growing quicker and modifying those starches before the big grains had a chance to do it. And what happens during the germination phase, there's some um, steeping barley just there. So you see the, the rootlets just starting to form on the end of the grain. That's the, the you know, visual sign to us that that grain's ready to start, start germinating. Um, but the grain basically generates these sugars and then it actually, the plant starts to use them up to continue growing. So we want to make sure we're maximising that and stopping that grain when it, those sugar levels are peaked. And again, if you've got inconsistent grain size, it's really hard to make that, that core. And you've got some grains that use the sugar up before the other ones have even started to work um, So after the steeping, we then push it out into these germination vessels where the grain basically grows. Um, and we modify the temperature, the humidity um, to control the, the growth of this, this grain. Um, and during this, this growth period, we've got the, the starches are being modified. Um, but also with the creation of, of enzymes, alpha-amylase, beta-amylase, beta-glucanase, um, which basically form our, our diastatic power, which I'll talk about as well. Um, as the grain starts to grow, it wants to mat up. If we transferred um, some steeping grain into here um, and filled the room to table height, if we left it for probably about 16 hours, um, it, you'd have to chisel it out with a shovel. The rootlets would grow that aggressively and it'd just kind of mat up and go fairly hard like, like cement. Um, and then it starts to get oxygen, it you know, starts to cross CO2, it starts to go mouldy. And so, um, one, we've got cool air being blown through the grain bed to keep it nice and fresh. But um, we also need to stop that matting from occurring. Traditionally, that was done with, with shovels. They cast it out into a floor and they go through with either shovels or rakes. Particularly over in Europe where it's nice and, nice and cool during the, the night or in the evenings they kind of pile the malt up on top of each other. The malt gives off heat and energy as it's germinating. And then they come back and they level it all out during the day to kind of keep it nice and, nice and cool. Um, growing up on the farm, I've done enough shoveling of grain to know that the romance was going to wear off fairly quickly. Um, so we designed some systems that, uh, that had some automated stirrers in it that just slowly go through and just turn the grain every kind of 12 hours. Um, and you can see them at the far end of one of our that vessel there is a, is a six ton uh, vessel, one of our mid sized vessels. Um, and then we monitor that, that conversion in the grain and when it's ready to, you know, when that's been maximised, then it's time to stop it from growing. And we do that by blowing huge volumes of, of dry air through it. Um, so the malting process is it's very water intensive. It's also very energy intensive. You, know, you spend a lot of time getting the moisture content up in the grain and then you spend a lot of energy removing that moisture content um, and we take the moisture level from about 45% down to 3%. We try and do that as quickly as we, as we can, which is normally around 12 to 16 hours. Um, and we do most of the drying at a temperature less than 58 degrees. Um, and that's to keep those, those enzymes that are in there, stop them from denaturing. Um, we run a biochar facility at our site. Um, this is again a bit of a, just a side story, but um, where we are in Griffith, being the Murrumbidgee Irrigation Area, it's also referred to as the food bowl of New South Wales. Um, there's a lot of agricultural waste, walnut shells, rice hulls, grape mark, cotton gin trash. Um, and the biochar unit was de developed to basically um, convert uh, any of that agricultural waste into pure, pure charcoal. Um, we actually process walnut shells. It provides a really high grade um, char that then gets sent to Toowoomba where they powder it down and make heat beads for barbecue briquettes. It also goes into cosmetics, charcoal toothpaste. Um, it's a soil amendment. Um, and it's also used as a livestock supplement for um, cattle to reduce methane emissions. So we take a, um, 
uh, a waste product, we turn it into a high value char, and in the middle of that process, we capture all the heat and we use that to, to kill our mould. Um, there are a couple of photos of the biochar unit just there. It's a completely emission free, free process. Um, and during kilning, we're basically um, controlling three levers time, temperature, and humidity to create a lot of different flavour profiles in, in the malt. So, obviously, if you malt something quite you know, hard and aggressively, you'll get a darker coloured malt and get more of that you know, toffee, coasted, um, uh, roasted kind of characters. You do it nice and light, um, you get those more grainy straw. Um, kind of characters. At the end of the molting process, we then head into decolming, so it's where we remove all the dried withered rootlets that come off it. It's a high value stock feed, it's really high in protein, about 30, 30 to 40 percent protein, um, and it gets sold to a, um, um, to a local piggery up the road. Um, and then we clean the grain, and then basically, if we do that process, our lighter style malt is, is Atlas. Um, I'm watching you guys pass it around. Feel free to have a chew on, on these. Um, so it's the, the lifestyle of what we do. It's made with a New World variety, La Trobe. Um, this particular one was grown by Jamie Kite in, uh, in Vinya. Um, but it's got high diastatic power, high extract, um, and it's what um, we, we basically sell to brewers to use in a very dry, clean, crisp lager. It's not a malt we tend to sell a lot of. Um, most of the brewers that, that yeah, the, I guess this is a, a, a very similar malt that you could buy from the big guys. These are the malts that the big guys do really well. Um, the second one we're gonna pass around. Do you use any of the bio jar in your, in your fields? Yes, yep, yeah. yes certainly, yep, definitely. Yeah. Um, so this next one's passing around is an older variety called Schooner. Schooner was actually developed down in Adelaide um, in the, the early 70s. Um, and it's a malt that is basically was superseded by higher yielding varieties. Um, so brewers, this doesn't yield that well in the paddock, doesn't yield that well in the brew house either, um, and it doesn't ferment out very dry and clean. So it leaves a lot of residual sweetness in there. Um, but it does have a really unique flavour profile to it. We actually have killed this one a little darker as well. Um, but you'll taste more of that kind of um, you know, sweeter toffee um, kind of characteristic as it comes around. Um, this would be similar to kind of a caramel or a melanoidin malt um, if you're familiar with, with um, different styles of malts from other, or other categories of malts. Um, and then we've got, last one we've got is a, not last one, the third one we've got is a, is a roasted malt. So we can take, that voodoo is kind of the darkest malt we do in the kiln. We can take malts and then run them in a, uh, a coffee roaster, basically, and pull them out at varying levels. So um, this one that we're passing around now is a chocolate malt, so we basically, we, we kiln it until we start getting some of that kind of bitter cooking chocolate kind of character from it as well. Um, and then the last one we're gonna have is smoke malt. So traditionally the way they used to dry malts out was they'd light a fire, um, and use the heat from that fire, but the, the malt would take on um, some of the smoke. So there would have been a period of, in time when all beers and, and whiskies had a smoky flavour to them. Um, it's something that's kind of stayed around in a lot of Scottish whisky, using peat to, to smoke um, the malts. And over here, uh, we sell a lot of malts to distillers. We don't have peat um, locally to us. We do have red gum down the river, so this is malt that's been, the fourth one's going around is malt that's been smoked over, uh, over local red gum. Um, and we've actually got a, a whiskey here that we'll try again here that's been made with, um, it's a rye whiskey that's been made with uh, smoked red gum. Um, and that malting process, as I said before, can be done on any, any kind of seed grain or, or legume. It's exactly the same process, you're just varying the time and temperature and, and the steep levels. Um, so I'm moving to the function of malt for, for bakers. Uh, as I said before, I'm not a baker. Um, and when we started, started Voyager, beer was my passion. Uh, and I just assumed we'd be selling to, to brewers. I, I just assumed that um, bakers didn't use malt for products and distillers weren't interested in, in flavour. They were just basically after the, the most amount of sugar uh, or alcohol they could get. Um, and that's traditionally what distillers malt was, was was it was a, a malt that was you could get the most amount of yield from. Um, so 
what I've kind of learned along the way, particularly with, with distillers and from bakers, is just phone calls when people call me up and saying, hey, look, have you got a diastatic malt? And I'd never heard of diastatic malt before. In, in brewing or distilling, we call that a base malt, basically. Um, but then working through what, you know, um, you know, essentially what the bake was after. I've put this together in terms of what um, I see the function of malt for bakers has, has been in terms of discussions I've had. So one colour, um, this is a, a Maillard reaction between amino acids and reducing sugars when heated can give that browning of, of the crust. Um, or also using small amounts of say that chocolate malt to add um, um, colouring to um, loaves, you know, pumping, pumping nickel or, or rye loaves or those kind of things. Um, texture, um, so malt can provide a more open crumb, a uh, softer, finer texture, it helps the bread stay fresh, a uh, softer crust. Um, and the other, in terms of, of texture, we um, have started selling a lot of sprouted um, grains into the, the baking industry. Um, basically, once grains are moulded, you'll notice chewing on those, they're all fairly friable, like powder up quite easily in your mouth, very different to chewing on a, on a raw grain. So the malting process breaks down um, that complex protein um, structure inside the grain. Um, so we're selling um, you know, a lot of sprouted pumpkin seeds and sprouted millet and these kind of things for use as whole grain in breads to make them a bit more palatable. Um, which would, yeah, so that's another thing in terms of texture. Um, nutritional, um, so um, particularly when compared to fructose, but malt contains one of the highest sources of soluble fibres, um, five times the antioxidant power of fresh broccoli. So uh, moving to malt for a, for a sweetener or, or adding it um, in place of something like fr fructose uh, is a you know, far, far more beneficial. As I said before, malt can provide a real deeper, more complex, softer, rounded flavour profile. Um, and it can also aid in rising if the malt is diastatic. Um, and this was something that, that so I'd, I'd never heard, I knew what, what you know, um, diastatic power was, but I'd never heard of a diastatic or a non-diastatic malt before. Um, we tend to refer to them in the brewing and, and distilling world as base or specialty malts. Um, but diastatic refers to having the ability to convert starch into, into sugar. Um, it's measured in diastatic power. Um, and basically it's a measure of the amount of enzymes available in the malt. Um, once, you, if you've got, once you've got enzymes available, once you add moisture and heat to them, um, they start to work in, in different, like I said, there's, there's, there's about eight different um, enzymes in malt cells. Al alpha amylase and beta amylase are the big ones. Um, but they work once moisture and heat supply them at different levels. Once you apply too much heat, they start to denature. So in the germination phase, when we're molten grain, we generate loads of, of en uh, enzymes, huge diastatic power. As we kill it, we start to denature a lot of them. So the darker we take a malt, the fewer enzymes are in there. So the first malt you had that was fairly light uh, in colour and light in flavour profile, um, that's by far got the, that's what we would call a diastatic malt, and that's what we sell to bakers when that's what they're looking for. Um, Voodoo, there we go. Uh, and so you're looking at the diastatic power of the second row from the bottom. Voodoo has a bit, still got diastatic power, so for, for me to kind of refer to that as a non diastatic malt kind of just doesn't feel right because it is, it's still, you still, there's still enough enzymes in there to convert that sugar, it just needs longer to do it. And down the bottom there, I've got the, uh, a mash time. So in a brewery, if you're using just purely Atlas and you wanted to convert all the sugar in that malt, it'll do it in less than 10 minutes. For the Voodoo, if that's the only malt you're using, it's gonna take about an hour. So because you've got fewer enzymes there, it's gonna take longer for them to do the work. Um, the chocolate one, because it's been drum roasted for three hours at 200 degrees, there's no enzymes in there whatsoever. So it'll never convert the sugar that's, that's in it. So if you're using um, something like Voodoo, thinking there's no diastatic power in there, um, there certainly is. Um, so as I said before, diastatic malt, malt. So again, if you're wanting to buy this straight from a local homebrew store or um, a, you know, another maltster, basically what you're looking for is lighter style base malts. There'll be things like pale malts, pil pilsner malts, distillers malts. Um, and where are we? And if you're ever unsure, any malts that are produced um, will come with a certificate of analysis. Uh, and on that certificate of analysis, you should be able to go down and find diastatic power, and it'll tell you what the enzymatic potential of that malt, malt is. It does vary year from year. So just um, the atlas that we're running now is around, what's that, 344. 
Some years it's up, up above 400, some years it's down below 300. So it is a bit of a seasonal thing, so don't always assume that if you're using a diastatic malt from a supplier that it's the same year in, year out. Um, but if you're ever unsure, ask for specific analysis and look for, for diastatic power. Um, and then we uh, look at the, I guess, what bakers refer to as non-diastatic malts and what we kind of refer to as specialty malts, and they're the crystals, caramels, chocolates, roast barleys, um, or some of the other flavoured malts, such as um, a smoke malt. And there's a talk tomorrow um, about some infused um, malts that I think the guys from Brice have been uh, developing where they're basically in the steep adding um, other ingredients and flavourings in there to bring through um, different characters in the malt. So, um, be really cool to check that one out. And as I said before, friability in terms of adding malted grains whole to, um, to, to loaves. Um, you can also get diastatic malt in other grains as well. So diastatic malt um, is a little bit lower in wheat and pale uh, in rye malts, but certainly still better as well. So um, if you are wanting to, to avoid, I guess one of the disadvantages uh, potentially, again, I'm not a baker, but the husk on barley is quite strong. And, um, you know, no doubt a few of you have probably still got the husk at the back of your mouth or stuck between your teeth or something after chewing on those um, grains there before. Uh, it's actually the reason why malt is, is, is so popular in brewing because that um, husk provides a really important filtering um, medium in, in the brew house, um, which is why um, beers are made with malt and not wheat, purely because of that, that, that husk. Traditionally, is why they've bought a malt and barley. So if, if that's an issue for you uh, when you're milling it up, um, then look to use something like a, a pale rye or a pale wheat um, and you can avoid that, that strong husk. And the other thing to keep in mind that malts are, if you, particularly if you're milling um, and you're used to milling raw grains, uh, malts are very low in moisture. Uh, so quite friable, but also quite hygroscopic. They will absorb a lot of, a lot of moisture. Um, cool, how are we up for time? Excellent. Um, so this is, this is a couple of slides from a much bigger presentation that I run aimed at brewers and distillers, trying to get them inspired about this, this what I'm calling a malt renaissance, uh, or a grain renaissance, this period of time we're entering where brewers have never had, and distillers never had so much choice to, to experiment and play around with such diversity in, in, in grains and malts and farming, farming practices. Um, and it's important to kind of think, I'd like to remind them just how far we've come. I, there's just a couple of quotes that have stuck with me, but I was at a brewers conference in Sydney, I think it might have been 2015 or 2016, um, and a brewer asked, when are we going to start getting some, some old heritage malts with a bit of flavour, a bit of character? Um, and one of the guys from Grain Growers basically said that you guys are always going to be too small to dictate. You're only ever going to get left, what's left over from the big guys, and that'll never change, and you know, that's, that's it. Um, in terms of traceability, um, at the same conference we had people talking about that it just that the infrastructure in this country just will never ever allow for that to happen. Um, barley breeding, we don't need to breed for flavour, it's not anything we look for. In fact, in certificate of analysis, only up until probably about six years ago, um, on a malt analysis, the only stats that were on there, so there's lots of numbers on a malt analysis I'll show you before about the sugar levels and the protein and diastatic power. Um, the only ever thing that was on there in relation to flavour was aroma and um, when you were doing the malt analysis you'd either put it was normal or it was aromatic. They were the two things that you, that was how you would evaluate malt flavour, was normal or aromatic. And that was how malts were evaluated in terms of flavour for, for up until six years ago when Brees developed this new kind of um, um, standardised methodology for um, doing a sensory on malt, which is just crazy to think that. And for the last 60 years where we've been breeding for, you know, as I said before, disease resistance and yield and all these kind of things, they haven't been breeding for flavour, they haven't been looking at flavour. Um, and the barley breed said, we, we look for the opposite of that. We don't really want something that's not going to stand out and not going to stick its head up. Um, and then talking about farmers, uh, about, you know, the agronomics don't stack up for farmers to grow heirloom varieties. So they might grow it once, but they're not, never going to grow, grow it again for you. And all this, this is basically, uh, yeah, well, I guess we've proven wrong over time. Um, so there's plenty of these little, I don't really have to call them, but trends, opportunities, things that are happening uh, at the moment that I think are kind of 
you know, bring us into this, this multiple um, grain renaissance. I'm going to talk about three of them today. The first one is this education, research, transparency. Um, as I said before, that's, they're the flavour, malt flavour maps that have been put together so that now as malt houses and brewers uh, and distillers um, and potentially bakers are actually able to sit down and look at the flavour of malt and what it attributes. Um, this might sound like, a, like the malt stream you're talking about, I get so pissed off when you go and grab a, a beer and look at it and there might be three sentences about the hops that are in there, tropical, piney, where the hops were grown and malt won't get a mention, or if it does, it'll say backed up by a solid malt backbone. And that's it, and we look at all the things that malt attributes to a beer, and the best we can do is describe it with what it's been called as, saying oh, it's got a malty backbone. It might get biscuit, or if it's a stout, it might get roasty or chocolate. That's about the extent of it. Um, so the great thing about these flavour maps is that it takes people through evaluating malt and basically building a lexicon, a, 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 you know, a terminology around malt flavour. And we take all our staff through it in, in, uh, in our lab and we're starting now to work with other malts, other brewers and distills when they're ringing up saying, look, we want a malt that's got um, you know, this kind of umame, miso kind of character. And we can kind of work through these um, flavour profiles to kind of work out which malts are delivering that. Um, so again, really cool that we've, you know, six years ago we had nothing like that. And now we've got this, this one that we've got plenty of breweries starting to use. Um, Adelaide University brought some research out recently where they're looking at um, provenance um, uh, and growing locations versus different barley varieties. Uh, basically what they found was that barley varieties taste different grown in the same region. Um, barley varieties taste different grown in different regions. Uh, sorry, the same variety tastes different grown in different regions. So a bit hard to see, um, but there's some, a lot of flavour compounds that come from soil types. Um, that came through into the, uh, into, into the beers that we're making for them. Uh, there's some really cool research coming out. I was in a taste of whiskey tasting last week of Waterford, a distillery over in Ireland. Um, if you haven't heard of these guys, I highly suggest following them. The work they're doing around um, provenance is phenomenal. Every um, whiskey they release is from a particular paddock. Uh, and they treat it all in the exact same way. So what you're tasting is the difference in the same variety between biodynamic and organic or a hairloom variety or whatever else. It's, it's, and the research that they're just starting to come out with is phenomenal. There's more than 2,000 different flavour compounds in whiskey. Um, and of that, they're saying that 40% of them are directly impacted by the, um, the growing of that, of that grain, which is kind of crazy because up until recently, Grain was just this thing you had to use to make whiskey. No one really cared where it came from or what the variety was. They just wanted the, the most highest yielding, uh, highest extract from. Uh, and we have got a whiskey here to try. I'm sure someone might come for some of it. And then we've here we've got um, places like Archie Rose that um, are doing something very similar taking grain from a simple paddock, taking yeast from, from that paddock as well, um, and, uh, and putting into some, some whiskies. The whiskey we're going to taste is actually uh, a, a red gum smoked heritage rye, so an old rye that we, um, we propagated up about uh, yeah, 10 years ago, more than that. Uh, yeah, 10 years ago in my paddock, um, and bred it up, um, and then this has been yeah, smoked with, with red gum. So a very unique, um, uniquely Australian whiskey. Um, if, if you aren't too familiar with drinking whiskey straight, um, just go easy. <laughs> uh, one thing I probably would suggest you do, this is, it is fairly strong, one thing I would suggest you do is maybe just to start, dip some on, um, get some on your fingers and rub it, or rub it on your hands, let the alcohol evaporate off and then have a smell, and you'll really get some of the graininess from it without getting all of those fusel alcohol. The other thing you can do, take a really small sip, and hold it in your mouth for five seconds and let the saliva kind of help to kind of break it down. Um, how old? Uh, five years. There you go. Um, the other thing that's happening, we've got um, government now that's starting to get involved. The New South Wales government um, teamed up with the independent brewers and put together an action plan. Um, Part of that was looking at uh, exploring um, heirloom varieties with the CSIRO. So great now that, you know, to think when we had people six years ago telling us we'll never get anything different than what the big guys want, but now we've got local government 
putting out white papers and, and, and um, you know, getting other government organisations to work together to explore um, LM varieties, I think is really exciting. Um, I said before, risk limited carbon audit, 70% of our emissions actually occur out in the field. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, how many of you are kind of familiar with this, but when we first learn on that, you kind of assume that um, growing grain out in the field, um, when 70% of the emissions or how emissions are coming out, you think it's the tractor and, and you know, uh, it's actually most of it is from nitrogenous fertiliser. Um, so we did an audit uh, where we thought, we, we teamed up with two American malt houses, we did an audit. Uh, and we thought we were doing fairly well. On, on farm, um, we, we grow our grains, so there's no food miles on it. Um, we reuse steep water, we're using the biochar. And when we put our numbers in, we weren't really that much better than these two other malt houses in the States until we started looking at where our grain was coming from. Um, and once we admitted, um, or once we subbed in organic grain compared to conventionally farmed grain, it cut our emissions in half. Um, so, so for what that means for a brewery, and, and breweries are great at doing it, getting out there, beating their chest, saying, hey, look at us, we just put solar panels on, or we've just gone from bottles to cans, or, um, you know, look at our spent grain, it goes to the farmer. Um, all those things are like less than 1%. The biggest thing they could do to reduce 40% of their emissions is move to organic or regeneratively farmed grains that don't have nitrogen for and that's the story that, that brewers are starting to hear. And we've got a lot of brewers now that are really getting on board with that. We're the breweries that have done these carbon audits and gone out there and done the, the climate active thing, gone out there, done the audit, uh, and then end up just paying money to um, get these carbon credits, which is just ridiculous in my opinion. But they can take that money and put into buying better quality malt that's grown in a system that is regenerative and organic. So, it's, um, I said it's, it's, we've seen some massive growth in that organic regenerative space and I think it's going to um, only going to continue based on this quest for brewers trying to um, reduce their carbon emissions. Um, and as I said before, heritage and heirloom varieties perform better in these farming systems. Um, we've got growers that want to be growing um, organically or regeneratively that can't grow the newer bred varieties. They're bred to basically put as much energy as they can into growing huge amounts of grain. There's no canopy on them, so they can't compete with other weeds. Um, so basically to grow them, they ha you have to use chemicals to grow these, grow these, these crops. Um, so we're giving them an option to say, hey look, we've got people that want these old heirloom grains, you want to grow them. Um, and we've got some great relationships that we're starting to form through that. And then just finally, um, growing up in Burrellan where lots of family, lots of friends have been in the, the commodity grain industry for, for a long time, um, growers are becoming very disenfranchised with that, that system. Um, look at the you know, price fluctuations, the changing specs, the, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, you know, farming since the age of 12, um, knowing that you can do everything right, have a great season, produce the best grain that you think you've ever produced and get paid far less for it than what you were expecting because everyone's had a great year so the price just, just comes down. It means that sometimes in good years we actually made far less money than what we would in, in, a, in, a, in a tough year. Um, ridiculous fees and, and storage charges and, and it's easy to see why a lot of these, these growers are becoming quite annoyed at this commodity based system. Farming's become fairly, i tell this story about, you know, I think when you'd ask people to think of a farmer, they think of someone with a cowboy hat and a flannel shirt and um, long sunsets and work for, your, work for yourself and a cruisy kind of laid back lifestyle and it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, it's a very highly competitive, high volume. The only way to really succeed out where we are has been to get bigger, um, get into more debt, get more land, buy more, more equipment, um, you know, get your cost of production down. So a lot of farmers are under significant debt. Um, this constant kind of kind of growth, and and I, I spoke before about um, suicide rates and, and depression, those kind of things. If you look at our town of Burrell, and it used to have eight banks back in the, the 30s. Now we've got a post office and a pub, um, a street full of empty shops, but no footy team, uh, netball teams just hanging on, no cricket team, um, pub closes. You know, it, it becomes very isolating for a lot of the, these growers and 
and they're buying their their neighbours out, they're buying their friends out. Like it's a, it's a pretty tough kind of cycle. Now I think for a long first time in a, in a in a long time, we've got farmers that are really wanting to downsize and go the opposite way. Um, and we know that because they come and knock on our door and they ask us what what can can we have them or what can they grow for us. Um, I think the other thing, I don't think any farmer generally wants to be operating in the current system that they're forced to operate in with this high, you know, huge, um, high, high you know, bulk grain, um, no recognition, no traceability. Um, the, typically, the, the cost of fertilizer and the cost of chemicals, I think a lot of them are starting to realize that they're actually going to hand their farm down to their kids in a worse condition than when they received it themselves. And that's, that's really tough for a lot of them, I think. Um, a lot of, a lot of um, my friends that are still farming don't want their kids to go back on the farm. Um, it's, uh, it's, it is pretty tough. But I honestly think that this way of downsizing and getting to, to you know, it, we, we, there's some opportunity there for them, particularly if we've got more brewers using those older grains. Um, and they've now got an opportunity to start farming in a way that we can provide them a premium to farming in the ways that they, they want to be farming is, uh, is pretty exciting. However, I think the biggest thing for a farmer is recognition. Um, and I think that's, that's a, a bit of a motivation for all of us in any job we do, particularly, uh, I'm assuming in baking, but particularly in brewing. Uh, brewers don't get paid terribly well. But I think it's having people tell you that's a good beer you've just made, or seeing people get enjoyment out of it, is something that really spurs a lot of brewers on, and probably why it is such a popular profession. Um, farmers get none of that. Um, the only recognition we ever got on our farm was maybe a, a neighbour looking over the fence going, "Gee, that's not a bad crop you've got there." And you knew when he turned his back and walked away, he would have been saying, "Shame, you're going to get paid exactly the same. I'm going to get paid for my shit crop just here as well." So I think that generally we've got a lot of people knocking on our door, a lot of farmers wanting to grow for us because they can get their name on a bottle of whiskey, they can get invited to a launch of a, of a new beer, they can take a six pack of beer that they know their grains into a birthday party or to a Christmas party and, and get that recognition of what they're doing. Um, one of the most proudest moments uh, for me in terms of what we've done with Voyager was at a, at a night um, we did at a brewery and we took one of our farmers along uh, and we're just sitting there having some beers that were made with a couple of different varieties of grain. And uh, a partner came up and said thank you to the, well, the brewer and the maltster was there with the farmer. And they came and they thanked the farmer and didn't say anything to us, and uh, which was great. Um, and the Jamie, the farmer, got really emotional. You could see him start to tear up. And as the uh, the partner walked, he turned around and said, "You know, it's, it's the first time in 30 years anyone's ever thanked me for what I'm doing." Um, it's uh, it's pretty powerful what, what I think we can achieve through um, traceability and, and single origin grains and giving farmers recognition for the work they do. Uh, I think that might nearly, nearly do us. Oh, and these are just some photos, I guess. Th these, are, these are photos of smiles on farmers' faces. Um, generally, and you know what? These, there's some big farmers in here. Some of these guys might be farming less than 1% of their farm to a weird variety that we've given them that they get the opportunity to play around without using nitrogenous fertiliser or whatever else and get paid really well for it. Um, it's got nothing to really do with the, the money that because of, of, you know, it's not their core business. But they see that there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. They say, if we can grow this market, maybe there is a future for my kids to, to come back onto this farm. Um, thank you.